So uh, welcome everyone to this uh, round table on the future of EV charging. Um, uh, I'm Mike Scott. I'm a, a freelance journalist writing on uh, energy and the environment. Uh, and we have a very distinguished panel here today. So I will quickly run through the introductions. Um, Pilgrim Beart is the CEO and co-founder of Device Pilot, the world's leading IoT uh, service monitoring platform, which works with companies including Podpoint to drive sustainability by delivering better service at a lower cost. And he has uh, more than 30 years experience in the tech industry in the UK and uh, Silicon Valley. Um, uh, and um, uh, is a serial entrepreneur having founded uh, several uh, successful businesses. Uh, Venus Jenkins is the co-founder and VP uh, operations at ChargeNet, a US-based EV charging provider, um, previously worked at Southern California uh, Edison, bringing clean energy to uh, Southern California uh, with projects including water power generation and um, deploying the largest fiber infrastructure in a project in Orange County. Uh, Julia O'Doherty is a senior product management in the smart energy team at Bulb, uh, helping uh, customers access products to lower bills and CO2. Uh, and before joining Bulb, she worked for uh, Omnicom Media Group uh, and retail innovation consultancy GDR. Ryan Fisher is senior associate at uh, the uh, analyst house Bloomberg in, um, New Energy Finance, specializing uh, in electric vehicles and charging infrastructure uh, and contributing to projects, including um, the Electric Vehicle Outlook 2021 uh, and before uh, um, BNF, he worked at Jaguar Land Rover. Uh, Professor Goran Strubach, I hope I've got that right, is. Professor of Energy Systems at Imperial College London, uh, and he has extensive experience, <coughs> excuse me, in advanced modeling and analysis of operation planning, security and economics of energy systems. Uh, and his recent research projects include peer-to-peer uh, -peer energy trading, integration of power to gas and low carbon road transport and microgrids. Uh, uh, and finally, Ethan, Lip Ethan Lipman, describes himself as an extroverted BSME from the University of, uh, from UC Davis, University of California, Davis, I assume. Um, he grew up in Silicon Valley and built a career focused on sustainability, working to mitigate the environmental impacts of food, shelter, water and energy to people across the globe. Uh, and Pilgrim is gonna start with a quick introduction on um, uh, the, the key topics that we're gonna talk about this afternoon. Great. Well, th thanks, Mike. And it, it's an honor to welcome so many experts to this panel today. I'll, I'll make quite clear that I'm the least expert person about EV charging on the panel today. Um, but uh, I'm, lo I'm looking forward to learning uh, a lot from you all. I suppose just to, to, to make a few naive observations to set the ball rolling, um, I think we're going to be deploying millions of charge points, aren't we, uh, as part of a, um, a broader energy transition where we move from centralized control of energy supply to decentralized control of uh, energy consumption at the edge. Um, so what kind of issues might, might we see? Well, uh, in the UK, our electricity grid uh, produces between about 30 and 50 gigawatts. Um, and uh, if we've got about 31 million cars on the road today. So if we naively say that we plug all those cars into our home chargers, just seven kilowatt home chargers, that's 200 gigawatts, uh, which obviously isn't gonna work. Um, now, I don't believe that there'll be national blackouts everywhere. I mean, I think I'm sure we'll find a way through, but I don't know whether that's down to statistics, consumer behavior, technology, uh, pricing. You know, there's, there's lots of possible ways that we might find our way through that. And, and uh, I'm sure we'll end up talking a bit about that today. And of course, it's not just the whole grid. It's, it's also the edge. So we're already seeing um, that in places that have a lot of PV, uh, when the sun's shining, the grid voltage is going out of tolerance uh, above uh, its normal voltage. And in areas where there's a lot of EV, um, uh, the grid uh, is, uh, the grid edge is, is falling below tolerance. So, so grid edge reinforcement and, and, and kind of managing that is as much an issue, I think, as, as the centralized grid. So I think, I think the first part of what Mike's gonna lead us through is about 
uh, is about the grid and what the grid needs. The second part, though, is to focus a bit more on consumers. What, what do we need? Um, how to incentivize us to play along? Um, is pricing enough? Standards? Questions like that. So um, it, it's a privilege. Uh, thanks and take it away, Mike. Great, thanks. So we're going to look at this in two parts. First, looking at um, the impact of EV charging on the grid and then looking at the, the practicalities of EV charging itself. So um, I'll come to Ryan first. Uh, we expect to see a huge uh, influx of um, electric vehicles onto the market in the UK in the next few years. How much more charging infrastructure do we need to, to enable those EVs to, to work properly? Yeah, so we do a, a, a forecast and that, that was obviously talked about at the start. And within that, um, the team of people here basically tries to join together everything from how many vehicles are we going to have to different types of transport to the impacts of those types of transport going into oil, but also electricity demand and charging infrastructure, which is where I come in. So in the UK today, we're somewhere around half a million EVs. And then by 2030, we're around 9 million in our forecast, moving on to 2040 to a fleet of around 28 million. And to support them, like you say, we're going to need a lot of chargers. And some of those will be at home and in workplaces and some will be in public. And there's a few things to kind of point out there. So one, there's going to be a lot of chargers at home to support people. If you can charge there, it seems to be one of the cheapest methods um, to do so and also quite convenient. But not everybody can charge at home. And there is, in some ways, a capital cost to do so. And, and uh, people might be put off by that. So what we see is a lot of people will have home chargers and they will take they will dominate the total number of chargers needed. However, there'll be a lot of energy demand delivered by some of these public chargers, particularly the faster ones. So they have much higher powers, but they also are utilized more heavily. So we look at the actual numbers for those uh, kind of 9 million vehicles in 2030, we're seeing somewhere around 4.4 uh, million private chargers. So those in homes and workplaces. Um, and in public, we're seeing going from today somewhere around 30 to 37,000 public uh, connectors to around 350,000 uh, in 2030, and then growing in 2040 to around 650,000 in public and around 11 to 12 million in, in kind of private locations. So um, a lot of charges required um, in, in that period of time and, and certainly moving on the kind of... Uh, scaling up of this industry and the annual numbers needed and uh, you mentioned that you know the various different uh types of chargers and locations um do you think uh any one of these will be a particular sort of pinch point or um you know will the rollout be fairly uniform for for each different type so we actually release a model, the one that does the model, we release with that the main results, but we also give clients the ability to change it. We're not um, able to look 20 years in the future and know exactly how this is going to be. Course, and yeah. certainly this industry has a lot of sensitivities. And one of the key ones, or, or two of the key ones, one is how many people are going to choose to charge at home or in public? And the second one is if in public, are you going to use these kind of seven kilowatt chargers that take multiple hours, or are you going to use the faster chargers that take minutes? So we have a more heavy weighting towards the faster chargers. When we think about mass adoption, you've got to uh, put a lot of these vehicles on the road very quickly and provide charging uh, conveniently. Now, that means, one, you want to be able to install these chargers quickly. And if you had only fast chargers, you need somewhere around 10 times less of them to serve the same amount of vehicles. And that gets into the kind of hundreds of thousands of charges difference. And you're talking the planning permission, the civil works to do that. And sometimes it's kind of can be a bit political as well on the street just outside me. It's a battle to park outside my house. And if you think about everybody having a slow charger, you've got the cables draping around. You've got a periods of time in the next 10 years where 50 percent of the people on the street are driving ICE vehicles. 50 percent of people on the street are driving EVs. And how do they kind of play out? So whilst we see somewhere around 85% of the chargers in public being slow, actually the 15% of fast chargers deliver a, a large amount of the energy, much larger proportions anyway. Um, so it's, it's important that whilst you might see less of the fast chargers, they are actually making a big dent in the amount of um, electricity demand in what they're serving. Okay. Uh, 
Julia, if I can turn to you, um, where are we at the moment? How much of an impact do you think charging infrastructure is, is having on the grid at present? Uh, and is the grid well prepared to be able to service this, you know, surge in demand from charging infrastructure that we're likely to see over the next few years? I certainly hope so. I think as, a, as an energy supplier, the two of the things that are top of mind for us are, are one, how do we incentivize people to charge when demand is lower to help balance the grid? And secondly, um, how our members can interact with their local distribution network operators to get a home charger at home simply and safely. So on the first point, we can incentivize people to charge their vehicles during times of low demand by offering cheaper charging at night and giving them tools to schedule and manage their charging from the bulb app. So we get closer to 2030 and you know, uptake of EVs increases, we're going to see you know, that increased demand for energy. And to balance that, the UK needs more installed renewable capacity and also grid scale storage solutions. We also need to see better infrastructure. So I think Ryan touched on this, um, kind of we need to see more of it around the entire country. Our own research found that there are 65% fewer public charges per 100,000 people in the north and in the south of um, England. And if we want households to switch to EVs, then we have to make it as simple as possible. And, you know, levelling up so that everyone has that fair access to public chargers and those faster charging speeds is a great place to start. When it comes to installing a home charger, um, you know, we hear from drivers that they find it quite complex. Um, we expect about one in 10 households, likely rising to about one in five in the future, will need to have potentially three appointments to get their EV charger installed. So they might need their um, energy supply to send out a meter engineer to upgrade the wires that go into their meter. Then they need to get in touch with their local um, distribution network operator to get their mains views upgraded. And only then could they safely have um, you know, a, a, a fast charger installed at home. And so we also need to make sure that this process remains quick and simple for consumers looking to get a home charger and that um, DNOs kind of have the, the abilities to schedule all these, these small jobs that many people will want and need. And do you envisage that process uh, being able to, to be streamlined so that uh, essentially someone else is doing all that work for the consumer and, and you know, they can get a charger installed with a minimum of fuss? It's a great question. And I think, um, you know, I'd hope that it can be simplified over time. I think there's opportunities for, you know, greater collaboration and um, there's different potentials for, you know, who's in installing it and what skills they themselves have and how we work with the DNOs. Um, UK Power Networks has been doing, I think, some interesting work in this space with their new Smart Connect portal where they're trying to streamline um, the application processes for, you know, connecting um, different smart technology to the grid and also um, thinking about how you connect, if, you know, if you're having um, your own kind of generation and exporting to the grid. So I think there's lots of exciting possibilities for how we can make consumers' lives even easier. Great, look forward to that. Um, uh, Goran, uh, we, we see lots of, uh, sort of overheated headlines about uh, the disaster uh, scenarios that EVs might cause, such as blackouts or consumers um, having to, to choose between charging their car or, or heating their homes. Uh, is this likely or, or do you think that we are going to be able to, uh, to easily integrate uh, this growth in EVs into, into the system? Well, definitely. We Can you hear me, colleagues? Yes, we can. Let me just see whether this is, yeah. Some signal is, anyway. Uh, yeah, we definitely think that uh, we, this, uh, if we do this in a smart way, so there would there will be no compromise between service quality delivered to the users, uh, uh, but you would have a very significant contribution to you know on the system side. Uh, uh, well, there, there are two aspects which I I'd like to mention here, uh, which we mentioned kind of smart charging and so forth, which which is very critical, but also there is a very big development now in what's called vehicle to grid concept, where the vehicles uh, could potentially inject power to the, to the grid. Uh, and there is, uh, uh, and there are, as you know, kind of uh, uh, innovation projects which are demonstrating this. And just to give an example, extreme example, you know, well, kind of high level example is that. Uh, we demonstrated, for example, that the uh, if we if we don't uh, 
you know, if you you charge your vehicle and you plug it in, uh, that the overall costs, you know, for say for char for charging a vehicle in 2030 will be about say 800 pounds uh, a year for charging vehicle. If if you go to smart charging, because the the vehicles on average, you, given our work with the Department of Transport, showed that vehicles are 90% of the time stationary, which means you've got a major opportunity to charge them when it's good for the grid, not, not when you plug it in, because, you know, when you, you plug it in and then you come back home at 7 p.m., you know, but, you know, it can be charged at 1 a.m., you know, uh, that, that would reduce the overall bills to about 10%, but the third one is this vehicle to grid concept that, uh, Given that we are, this is a bit technical, we are moving into into the uh, low carbon world, and there would be significantly uh, significant contribution and penetration of renewables in there, and there are issues that renewables uh, managing renewables is a very big challenge because there is a little bit of inertia, which is a problem. You know, it's not a rotating conventional generator, uh, and that uh, if we, for example, if there is a loss of a big generator conventional say nuclear power station, then we would need to have significant amount of power to be injected uh, to, to avoid the collapse of the system. But this would require say 10 minutes injection from, from the vehicles which are in there. And we demonstrated that if we make this happen in 2030, that the, 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 the uh, EV drivers should get paid about 800 pounds for you know per year for charging the vehicles and that is that is that is now getting on the agenda very big because the you know uk we've got the problem that you know the island system and combination of nuclear and, and renewables is is a very big challenge and again given given you know that that uh, this is particularly big value overnight when you know lots of vehicles are in there and 10 minutes injection would not make a would not make a big difference is that we could uh, potentially, you know, support cost effective transition to low carbon system by having the vehicles probably, probably this, this critically important, you know, balancing, you know, frequency regulation when we lose a big generator. And uh, if the market, as I say, was was correct, we demonstrated there would be, you know, that uh, driving, you know, the drivers should get paid for charging the vehicles because because the contribution to the system is is very significant. And this is now getting uh, slow, it's not yet, but it's on, definitely on the agenda. And the question is how these, how the uh, you know market and policy framework should evolve to make that happen. Yeah. I don't know whether I'm talking too much, but uh, no, no, that's 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 great. I was just going to ask you: um, Is this something that technologically could happen now, and it's just a a question of scale, or do there need to be changes to? either the vehicles or the charging infrastructure or the network to, to accommodate this? Well, this is now being, it's, it's uh, you know, according to, according to uh, and I'm not a kind of technologist in, in detail, but uh, uh, according to this, these demonstration projects with Innovate UK, uh, it is, uh, technology can be done. Uh, we just need a bit of a standard so, so, that, the, so that the developers of these, of these chargers would know what to do. Uh, but it is uh, it is very very cost effective given the numbers which which, which we were provide we we, they gave us to us from from this consortium you know the, as I say that was uh, you know uh, order of magnitude two order of magnitude smaller than what the benefits are so we right. should try to make that work sure okay can I ask a question just around the frequency because we've done some research on the vehicle to grid and I think it's a is a really interesting area. And if you look at V2G, largely when they say you can make a lot of money on it, a big proportion of that is related to this frequency response market. Indeed. But the frequency response market is quite small. And if, if even the vehicle fleet today could do it, you'd probably saturate the market in that there's so many vehicles, they're all available for V2G. There's so much uh, supply that the price plummets. And then actually the reasons you do it might fall. And I just wondered within that explanation around uh, nuclear and the inertia in the system, is it that you're expecting the frequency response market to be a lot bigger in the next decade and therefore it won't become saturated and there'll still be value to it? Absolutely. I mean, we have, we have carried out some work with the Committee on Climate Change showing that with this in 2030, for example, 
that the volume of auxiliary services market in the, in the conventional way would increase 15 times while the you know while the cost of energy production would would half if we go to renewables and you know for example also last year you know in uh, uh, may june and july given the given the covid uh, the balancing services because demand reduced uh, the balancing services costs increased three times so it is it is a very very big challenge mm. and i agree with you you know because when you calculate how how many you know there would be a uh, you know, if we electrify, you know, so, so, you know, all say buses, taxis in line and so forth, you know, there will be obviously there will be tens of gigawatts of batteries, you know, we, we would not need all of those. Uh, but uh, still, you know, as I say, 2030, given the data which, which were provided, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, very, very big and important benefit. Uh, and there will be obviously, you know, the, if, if this can be done kind of cost effectively, there will be that the driver sh should get paid, you know, as I say, it was 800 pounds a year for charging the vehicles. Yeah, cool, thank you. Uh, I'll move on to Ethan now um, uh, and ask you partly to give a, a US perspective on, on vehicle to grid, but also um, the total amount of uh, power generated isn't the only limit. What are the, the changes that, that we need to see at the grid edge to facilitate the scale of EV charging that we're going to see over the coming years? That is a very good question. And it is a very big question because the answer is we need to see a big amount of change at the grid edge. Uh, so, so I've been working on deploying infrastructure in the United States for you know, the better part of three years now, which amazingly makes me a an expert and a, a veteran in a new industry, right? Um, you know, just just by way of background, I, I don't I don't think I wrote my uh, my blurb all that expertly, but I, I should note that you know I started in the solar power industry in two thousand and six, experienced that going from very small niche market in California to a massive scale. And in 2017, when I joined the ranks of folks around the world working on and deploying and modernizing infrastructure to support electric vehicles, it felt like I went back to 2006 in the solar power industry. And that's what a lot of my colleagues say. So we're, we're at the beginning of this thing and we're gonna have to get from early adopters to mass market and the way we're ha we have to do that is leading with the infrastructure. If you can't charge an electric car, it's just like a phone that doesn't have any batteries. And you'll see me log off real quick if this phone runs out of batteries, right? It's a brick. So when I think about the infrastructure in your question, the amount of the, you know, the ease and the speed with which we can deploy this infrastructure is predicated on doing the right things in policy, whether it's policy with authorities having jurisdiction, making up for an, a, a, a well-designed process for permitting things, or whether it's a very tight process with the utilities where private companies and utilities are working well together. But that grid edge component of just the enormous amount of work that has to be done there I've been deploying transformers in the United States, mostly in California, but in other states as well. It, I mean, the companies I used to work for from EVgo and ChargePoint, they're deploying equipment across the country and it's a large country and the grid gets very, very small. The pipe gets very, very small towards the edges there. And if you, you, if you get toward the edge and you don't have the capacity to get the power over there, then you're not gonna have fast charging there unless you deploy battery and solar and wind at the edge of the grid. And the value here is, you know, we still need the transmission. There's a lot that was learned in the United States about the value of lots of transmission, like in Texas, where we have enormous amounts of wind resources that have enabled 
a lot of, you know, if you look at the renewable portfolio standards, there's not a lot of people outside of the United States that would have said, Texas is leading the way in renewable energy. Yes, they are. There is a lot of sun coming down, but they harnessed a lot of wind and a lot of that came from transmission. It is very expensive to reconductor and build new transmission and trench transformers and conduit underground. I've been doing that work and have been deploying chargers in the ground at the grid edge. And I can tell you the utilities cannot service the load that we are gonna put on the grid unless we, unless we deploy a lot of battery, a lot of energy storage, a lot of solar and a lot of wind in concert with these new loads. Okay, um, and you talked about um, the the role of policy here. So, who who has to do the heavy lifting here? Is this a federal thing, a state thing, or even um, you know coming down to to the utilities them, themselves? That is a terrific question, and the first thing I'll say is it's extremely important that everybody be rowing the boat in the same direction. Yeah. There are so many times in my life where I've seen Apple do this and Microsoft do that, and we all know what the results of that are. You end up with a document that you open on one computer and it doesn't open very well on the next. The degree to which we succeed and, and, and speed things up in this transition is all related to collaboration. If over the last four years in this country, we had an administration that was pointing in the direction of coal and we had an industry that was pointing in the direction of electrification. Now we have both the politics and the business pointing in the direction of electrification. And there's a lot of money being proposed to solve these problems and deploy this expensive infrastructure. Trenching is not cheap. It, this is labor costs, and I'll tell you from living in California, California labor costs do not care. <laughs> they will keep going up. So, so this stuff is expensive, and on the policy piece of that, we don't want to waste money running around in circles chasing our tails around policy problems. I'm, I'm speaking maybe a little bit off the cuff here, but it's coming from a place of experience, seeing things go slowly and seeing things go fastly when I worked in the solar power industry for 15 years. When we had everybody rowing the boat in the same direction, we deployed a lot of PV very quickly. And when somebody like a utility wants to obstruct that, like they did in Arizona, a number of years ago, you can look up Arizona Solar Finito. Mm -hmm. And you know if the utility chooses a different approach, if they decide for some reason, if the politics go in a different direction, we, we are dependent on the utilities to be great actors and enthusiastic advocates of this industry. And while it is true that you would think they're gonna be 100% on board because of, this is a new load, these are customers for them. In, in many places in the United States, we have what's called you know, a semi-regulated, it's, it's, it's a different regulatory regime depending on where you go in the United States, we have some discontinuities here, some fr market fragmentation, if you will, that might not be the same in other countries in the world. In, in the United States, our freedom provides us the ability sometimes to be shackled by a certain amount of, it does it this way over here and does it this way over there. It's hard for a company like ChargePoint or EVgo or Tesla or anybody to work one way across the board. So, Rowing the boat in the same direction is super important. The utilities absolutely have the ability to pass rate tariffs and you know, make, make, they can be market makers or they can be market killers. It's also true that individual permitting authorities, whether it's the city of X or the county of Y, like they can also slow a project down or speed it up. And that's not to say that safety should be ignored if there's ADA accessibility laws, they need to be followed. They need to make the equipment accessible for people. There's other codes and standards that I could get into later that are extraordinarily important in the United States, but I'll mention one of them by name right now, which is ISO 15118. Right, okay. Um, 
So, Pilgrim, I'll move on to you now. Um, Ethan's talked about some of the barriers that the policy can present. What, what do you see as the key challenges to, to bringing about the, the improvements that we need to, to get this EV charging infrastructure into place? So I suppose, I mean, like Ethan, I make analogies with things I've done before. And, and, and the, the thing I did before was build one of the UK's first smart home platforms, which is now called Hive. So we deployed millions of connected devices and we discovered that building it is hard, but, but running it is even harder. Um, uh, and, and right now, I think a lot of EV people are focusing on the building part. You know, can we get the permits? Can we get the electricians? Um, get the stuff in the ground. Um, but, the, but I know that the next bit that happens is, is actually running this, this, this estate. And I think today's EV drivers are early adopters and early adopters are pretty tolerant of things not working because they like the whizzy new stuff uh, and they're prepared to suffer occasionally for that. But we're now moving into the mainstream uh, and, and mainstream consumers are not like that. They, they expect stuff to just work, uh, to be boringly reliable. Um, you know, when you go to fill up your your ice uh, car in a petrol or gas station today, it works every time, completely reliably, independently. And, and the same is definitely not true of EV charging anywhere at the moment yet. Um, and, and that's quite a problem. So I think we're going to hear a lot about customer experience, about reliability, about quality. And from a vendor point of view, that becomes relevant as competition happens. So if you've only got one choice of supplier, if they're not very good, it doesn't matter. But we're seeing so many players pushing into this market now, competition is going to very rapidly be an important topic and, and quality of experience is, is probably the determinant about who, who you choose as a consumer, you know, once you have a choice. Uh, and so you, you talk about all these uh, new competitors coming into the market. Um, does that mean interoperability is going to be a, a key factor? You know, you're going to customers are going to want to go to whoever's charge point they use uh, and plug in and, and not, you know, not go, oh, I've, I've got the equivalent of a, a Samsung and this is an Apple charger, you know, or vice versa. Yeah, and I think you see that in degrees at the moment in, in public charging, for sure, in the UK. I mean, you uh, if you've got a Tesla and you plug into a supercharger, it is completely yeah. slick. <laughs> you, know, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to think about anything. It just works. It's even yeah. a petrol pump. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, you know, if you, if you, you know, for most other people, that's not true. Um, and, and so, I mean, the electrical standards are, are there, you know, the, the plug fits, but the, the whole thing of billing um, and, uh, and everything else is, is still a bit of a mess. Um, uh, and I think, you know, can, do not, again, when we talk about mainstream consumers, do not underestimate the importance of convenience. People will pay a lot of money and go to a lot of lengths to just for convenience you know and, and they don't live to charge their cars they live to go <laughs> and have a good time and all those sorts of things and they just do stuff um to just to just work and, and that's not really the case at the moment sure uh and venus uh do these these issues that pilgrim is talking about uh ring a bell with you do they sort of chime with the the experience that you're seeing uh in the us that, that customers are are facing or are things working better over there? No, they're not working better. <laughs> I think it's, these are, uh, this is a nascent market for sure. And uh, universally, we're all facing similar challenges. Um, I quickly would like to touch upon what Ethan said and what Pilgrim said uh, regarding just tying the customer experience with how we make it possible. Um, we, we have to have proper utility incentives in place. In the US, we, uh, we have a lot of challenges connecting to the grid. I'm coming from the, the private industry perspective. In order for me to get the interconnection connected to the utility side, it takes, nine, any, it takes anywhere from nine to 12 months. Now I'm looking at DC fast chargers even if after they have streamlined the process, um, I, I don't know if they have enough urgency or a proper incentives aligned with deploying this infrastructure. Uh, the grid is aging, especially in California, it's over hundred years old. Um, yeah. So expect to put a local hotspot of half a megawatt to a megawatt by deploying six to 10 DC fast chargers. 
that requires an upgrade of infrastructure that causes nine to 12 month delay, sometimes even 18 months delay. Those are real challenges. So there needs to be proper utility incentives to make this a priority. Um, so that's one, one point. Go ahead, Mike, sorry. Uh, no, no, you carry on and I'll come back to my question. Okay, and then uh, to Pilgrim's point, customer experience. Um, I wanna emphasize this because that's, that's why um, I left the utility and joined the private side of the house, uh, uh, a new company. The customer experience, I'm just gonna be very blunt. It's terrible. It's terrible, it's terrible. I have had an EV for five years. I have talked to a lot of folks who have had EVs. Um, my first Kumbaya moment with my team was, let's talk about our experience with EV charging infrastructure. And the customer experience, I even last night, I was looking, when I was doing some research into UK charging infrastructure, there were a few videos and it was to the T similar experience. Half of the chargers don't work. Um, there isn't proper lighting. Uh, they, all these different, to Pilgrim's point, all these different market players are coming in and they expect the customer to sign up on their app and takes like 15, 20 minutes and asking all sorts of questions. And uh, you know, if this has to become mainstream, they don't understand it's seven kilowatt, 50 kilowatt charger, what that means. And I actually made a pretty long list of uh, all the things that, you know, that result in very poor customer experience. And I'm gonna emphasize one more point what Pilgrim said, the customer does not care about charging. They wanna go from point A to point B. And in between charging is just similar to going to a gas station, getting your gas and moving on to do the thing you really wanna do. And when you make it complex, when you make it unpleasant, um, when you just add all these layers, this is not gonna go mainstream. This is actually gonna deter people from getting an EV and actually become blockers. So those challenges exist in the US, those challenges exist in the UK. And from our perspective, who are passionate about building this infrastructure, you have to have the customer frame of mind when you're executing. And that, I'm gonna bring it home, that has to work ubiquitously with utilities, utilities understanding customer experience as well. Sure. So. I'll end it there. So, uh, Goran, uh, did you want to come in here? Yeah, just just to uh, you know, uh, uh, similar case uh, regarding this uh, you know availability of charging point. This was just a bit of a joke. It was three and a half years ago, I think. For uh, you may know that in London, if you now want to open up a new taxi business, it cannot be on petrol vehicles. You have to have a electric taxi. And I was just happened to be, you know, uh, in, in the first taxi, say four years ago. And then uh, I said, wow, electric taxi, wonderful. And the driver said, absolute disaster. <laughs> there are no charging points in the right places. Yeah. So, uh, and, uh, and there is an uh, 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 issue that, uh, because, you know, some of these charging points, you would need to reinforce local networks, which, which means you, in London, you would need to dig the roads to put the cables in new ones to be able to do that and there is there is a bit of there is a quite uh, you know concerns about uh, are we going to build the chargers in the right place so there is a kind of there was a policy kind of oh don't do the chargers before we know where the vehicles are but lots of people would not buy the vehicles if there are no charging points and that is that is now getting big on the agenda and i think that uh, in the uk there seem to be now uh, you know strong thinking that we, we need to have a strategic approach to deployment of the of the charging points and hopefully that would happen and that would then roll out because also as you mentioned there was also quite well, we had an internal discussion you know a few months ago and lots of you know colleagues who were thinking about buying vehicles decide electric vehicle decided not to buy it because of this absence of the charging points and you know if you travel you, you, you cannot do it so so that that but i think this is now it's now firmly on the agenda, and I hope we're going to move forward, you know, in a more strategic way to make the because London wants to have all buses and taxis electrified by 20, you know, in the next less than 10 years. So to make the charging infrastructure will be critically important to make that work. And I hope we are now on the agenda. This is now strongly on the agenda. 
Sorry for... Uh... No, 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 it's a, a, a great point that you make. Um, and it does actually bring us nicely onto the sort of second part of, uh, of the discussion, which is about the practicalities of, uh, of EV charging. Um, uh, Julia, if I can come to you, uh, we, we talked a little bit about um, the importance of uh, getting people to, to charge at the, the right time. Uh, so how do you uh, incentivize people to do that? Uh, um, how important will agile tariffs be uh, in that whole process? So I think Venus made this point beautifully um, that we really need to start with consumer needs and, and what they want, which is a simple and affordable way to charge wherever they are. We know that about 80% of charging happens at home at the moment where it's possible for, um, you know, it's more convenient for people. They don't have to travel anywhere to do their charging. Um, they can, you know, choose a tariff like our EV tariff that means that they're getting, you know, a good price for, um, you know, conveniently charging overnight and where they can manage their own home energy usage as well. Um, so at Bulb, we're building EV products that let customers take control of their charging and manage and schedule it in the app so that there's less kind of thought that goes into when is my car charging and am I making the most out of those off-peak rates. We also know that about a third of the country won't be able to have a charger at home. Um, and so that's where I think having that fully integrated and reliable public charging network is really important. Um, Venus touched on kind of how people can pay. And if we think about, you know, paying for fuel or train tickets, you know, wouldn't it be great if I could just pay with my contactless card on any charger, wherever I am, and I don't have to think about it beyond that. Um, thinking more specifically about those real-time tariffs, when we speak to our members, what we hear is that they want to feel confident about how much their energy bill will cost them. Um, and they want us as an energy supplier to help them manage and minimize that cost. So with real-time tariffs, you have to be really engaged with and aware of your consumption patterns. You have to know that you could shift it out of those um, peak uh, usage hours in order to kind of benefit from um, the, the lower costs um, and, and there'll be people that can't do that so if we think about families for example if I think about my sister who recently got um, a Renault Zoe and has two young children you know she's picking up the kids from school she's coming home she's getting dinner on the table it won't be possible for her to kind of move their consumption out of those peak hours um, and, and I think residential storage and things like vehicle to home in the future will introduce more options, more kind of flexibility for people. But those have really high upfront costs at the moment. And so that's also not, you know, an option for most people. Um, and I think as well in the current climate of rising wholesale prices, you know, those real time tariffs introduce even more uncertainty that, you know, won't be palatable for many people that are trying to manage their energy costs. Uh, do you think that we'll get to a situation again where a lot of uh, this management of, of uh, you know, when you're charging and, and therefore of the costs will be automated, you know, uh, through AI and machine learning and, and, you know, just general digital wizardry. I think, um, so I can see that happening in some ways, but I think people always want to feel that they have an element of control. You know, it's, it's their car. They want to be able to use it when they need it. Um, and so I think it's about how do we make things simpler for people, kind of take that load off for them so they're not having to actively think about what's happening when, that we're helping them manage those costs and, and kind of charge at the times, you know, they're better for the, for the grid um, and, and, you know, for them to save money. But also people want to know that they have an element of control, that they understand what's going on, that they know that their car is ready to use when they need it. And so I think there's, there'll be a need to find that balance um, to kind of, help them have the benefits, but also that sense of control that they need. Sure, okay, thank you. Right, um, this is a question for Pilgrim, which I suspect uh, there's some deep personal experience about to come into play here, but uh, what have your experiences been of making EV charging work in the context of your own home and how it interacts with other energy devices? Go. Yeah, well, I suppose I mean, I'm going to echo some of the things that, uh, that Julia said for sure. I mean, I've, I've had an EV for two years. I've been on an Agile tariff for a year. And so just to explain what a UK Agile tariff looks like, you, you basically get charged half hourly increments. So the price can vary a lot, half hour by half hour. And the price gets set on a rolling 24 hours in advance. So, so you know, and you can look at an app and see, okay. Uh, and it can change enormously. So my my price can be as expensive as 35 pence per unit kilowatt hour. Um, it's, it's capped at that. Or it can even go negative. So if the wind's blowing a lot um, at night, then the price may go negative, like minus 5p uh, um, a unit. So 
when I got my Agile tariff, I was like, oh, excellent. You know, my EV massive load is going to be able to make fantastic use of, of, of all this flexibility and charge at sometimes at negative rates. Wow, fantastic. And, and to some extent, that's true. Um, but what I quickly found is that my, my car doesn't really understand my Agile tariff. My Agile tariff utility can't really manage my car properly. I tried plugging a um, party service in a little mom and pop uh, piece of software, which, which can talk to both the APIs and it kind of tries to juggle. Uh, and it sort of worked, but it wasn't very reliable. And so sometimes I found that my car didn't have a charged battery in the morning, which is not good. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, I think the smart meter is really interesting because I kind of feel like, you know, the first wave of smart meters, most people, I mean, you know, there's a lot of smart meters in the UK now. Um, but in their first 10 years, they've only really been used for sort of billing, you know, to save people having to read the meter, which is not, there's a lot, they can do a lot more than that, I think. And, and so um, I, I, I wonder, you know, to what extent they can be an enabler at the core of, of all of this. Um, and people are even talking about sort of behind the meter metering. So if you can meter, fiscally meter the consumption of a car, you could then put that on a separate a tariff that's entirely separate from the rest of your household, for example. Um, I mean, as, as Julia says, I absolutely, you know, echo that, that thing that you find living on an agile tariff, you discover that there are things you can shift and things you can't, you know, you're, you're washing and drying, absolutely, you can shift that somewhere else. But, but if it's time to cook the children tea, uh, then, then that's just gotta, gotta happen, it's not shiftable. Um, and even though I'm an early adopter, even though I'm a geek, um, I, 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 I'm getting a bit bored of, of having to look at what the price is going to be and trying to, ju trying to juggle everything. Um, uh, I think I would be quite interested in working one removed from that, actually. So if I had a choice of solutions for juggling, <laughs> you know, trying to match my EV charging to my Agile tariff, I'd quite like to, to play those a little bit like buying unit trusts, you know, uh, as an investor, perhaps, rather than investing in individual shares. So I, I'd still like to perhaps have some control and, and choice, um, but the kind of the really hands on stuff uh, is a bit uh, is a bit geeky. Um, so I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready for somebody to take this problem away from me. I think. <laughs> I want to. I'm wondering if we can make this a bit conversational after that. That was. Uh, I mean, you really showed yourself as an early adopter there, and I think it's worth a little bit of conversation around what that is and what that what, what we see going forward. I don't want to derail things, but can we can we kind of have a little conversation around this early adoption that. We just heard from somebody that knows this sector and admits how painful it is to be an early adopter, right? Car not charged when you wake up because uh, these are things that mainstream users, after you've crossed the chasm, it'll turn them off. You know, the story that he just said, you know, we, we can all be dorky about it and go in and, and, and it, it didn't ruin our day, but the the person that's late for work and had a bad experience with their EV because they didn't have a charge when they woke up, they're not going to recommend that to their neighbor. And that slows vehicle adoption. So is there some way then of uh, getting the benefits of, uh, you know, these agile tariffs and you know the the reasons that they are there which is to to shift the load without having to to think about it can so, you know we're automating and digitizing everything can can, can this be done with you know with, with this time of use charging ryan there's going to be problems like we all know there's going to be problems and mitigating those problems there's going to be bad software there's going to be mistakes and somebody's going to push a software update and it's going to fix it or make it worse we'll find out right the the we don't do anybody any favors by being dishonest about what's coming. This is a massive undertaking. Like I've already been involved in a massive undertaking, but it's just going to get bigger. We're changing, you know, what, what's, what's the age of the existing infrastructure, whether it's a hundred year old, you know, piece of gear, like this is a massive change. And the, the software that needs to get written, the standards that need to get finalized, Earlier, there was discussion about a, a, having a great customer experience or a not great customer experience. And, and, and us early adopters, we can, we, you know, as we have the, the, the pain of dealing with 
what one of my former colleagues from ChargePoint recently bought a Mach E from Ford and you know went to a charger. It was dark, there was no light. She got stranded, she ran out of juice, the charger didn't work. She's in the dark at night with a beautiful new car, and it doesn't, it's a brick. Right. Yeah. So th th these are the stories of the early adopters. It's not, and it's not just electric vehicles. It's possible for some, it's 99.99% not the case, but I have gone to a gas pump that was out of order and they were all shut down and I didn't have any gas. And the consequences for that are I could just have, I could run across the street and get a gallon of petrol and put it in my tank. Right. And yeah. there's companies that are going to raise, rise to solve these problems, but and, and yes, I do want the vehicle, the, 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 you know, I mean, to have a flexible, you, you want to push people in the right direction, right? Incentives matter. And if you make it easy for people to do the right thing, they'll, they, but let me, let me really say what, what's true for me, right? I drove a Chevy Volt, which I was embarrassed to not be able to charge <laughs> on my DC fast charging network, right? I drove that gasoline and electric car to my projects all around the country because I didn't have the, you know, the, the chargers weren't on. I didn't have utility power yet. So I wouldn't have been able to drive an EV back. There was no charger. It was a brick. Sure. And, and I, I want, I want to say to the answer of like, okay, if the utility signals saying the, you know, the price is this, the price is this, the price is this, the human is never going to change their behavior unless it's easy. And if you have to fiddle with some apps, I remember years ago, GE was working on whether it was the nucleus product. I mean, the idea of the, the, you know, the smart grid where you have devices directly responding to a, a signal, that can, a pricing signal that tells the dishwasher to turn on. This is, maybe this is pie in the sky stuff. Maybe it's exactly what Pilgrim's working on. But these are, these are I mean, I want that future and I know we're not there yet, but I, I do want to just, really push on if the incentives are pointed in the right direction if you make it easy people will do the right thing and then and i mentioned a number i saw 15118 earlier if we don't get that right where we have authentication in the cloud yeah where a car any car in the business in the entire industry i don't care if it's from vw in germany or toyota in japan or ford in the united states or hyundai i don't care all of them have a vin number and whether it's that or a MAC address or something else that's been identified, ISO 15118 was pointing the direction of making it easy for the customer. And I've seen problems in the United States where existing incumbent players are making a moat and saying, we don't want ISO 15118. We want to protect our existing interests and we got to generate shareholder value. You know, the public needs easy charging all the way across the board. And if you can't get to a database where you can authenticate to a car, plug it in and walk away without tapping a card or fiddling with your phone, your batteries could run out on your phone. Yeah. That's not a payment device, it's a backup. Yeah, okay, thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna to come to Ryan and then Goran uh, quickly. So Ryan. Yeah, um, I had a few comments written down. I'll respond to maybe the bit that Pilgrim was on about. And we tracked some of these tariffs and, and how they work with the consumers. And one of the most simplest ways that I can see at the moment, one of the companies is saying it's 6p per kilowatt hour whenever. So they're undercutting the general rate. But to get that rate, you have to sign up to flexibly using your car. And as we've already heard from Goran, the car is already sat there for 90% of the time. So the consumer then, they don't have to look around at when am I using my kettle? When am I using it? They're always getting 6p. And then it's on the utility to be able to use the asset more flexibly in the markets. They're taking the risk on that. So just in response to that question, I think that might be the way that becomes easier for consumers, the price comes down, and then it's on the utilities and those other grid operators to make the most of that flexibility. From an EV charging behavior perspective, I think if we think today, we're at maybe tech 2.0, we've gone from the early days of the Nissan Leaf, we're now getting to the 100 kilowatt vehicles. A lot of vehicles now are actually gonna have 800 volts. You see more platforms coming out, we think to 2030, you get to that stage. And that means you're gonna see more, more cars that can charge over 200 kilowatt, and that becomes more quickly. Then you think about the business model. One we've talked a lot about is the actually plugging in the chargers to the grid and the difficulties, but these chargers cost a lot today, but we're seeing those costs drop really quickly. And if the costs drop, 
then the price per kilowatt hour you pay is going to be uh, much less and therefore people will be incentivized to use some of these faster charging technologies. Then there's the location of them. So we talk about going to gas stations and EV charging isn't the gas station. Well, I would agree it's not the gas station, but it's kind of a, a level on from that. So what I see is a lot of retailers announcing and installing fast chargers on their premises. And if you look at gas stations today at supermarkets, they deliver about twice the amount of fuel than an independent site. And by that, I mean the BP on the road or whatever. And it's because one, they're convenient, I'm going to the supermarket and therefore, well, I'm next to the supermarket, I'm going to go. And also because it's subsidized. And I think this kind of model is going to come in and change behaviors and push people because 30% of people was the number we heard. Nobody exactly knows how many it is. Can't install a home charger. Some people will opt not to because it's difficult and it's capital intensive. And therefore you need somewhere for those people to charge. And I had two points, which was, if you look out into the future, you get to 2050, 70% of this energy demand is not from your private passenger car. When you talk about electric vehicles, it's from trucks, it's from buses, it's from vans, it's from shared vehicles. And therefore, you're going to need multi megawatt charging solutions and things for those. And then the final point I make from about 2030 to 2035, we see autonomous vehicles kicking off. And as autonomous vehicles come in, they change what you need in the charging network. So you're going to start to see some charges become more highly utilized and some probably become redundant, uh, which is probably not great from some business perspective, just as that's been set in 2030. And this will probably push a change in the types of hardware needed. So your robotic chargers, your wireless chargers will just be needed because who actually wants to say, well, let's let's add a person to the plugging in processes of this car that we've already got. It doesn't make any sense. So perhaps even before autonomous vehicles come, robotic chargers, wireless chargers will become uh, part of the solution because people can see that in five years time, they don't want to be spending a load of money on something that's not necessarily going to fit those vehicles. So although today, I think the big question is when a car manufacturer is stopping selling ICE vehicles, there's probably going to be a big question in the next 20 years of when are they stopping selling vehicles you can drive all together and how do we charge those ones as well? Okay, Gordon? Very much agree with this. Uh, uh, just to mention one of, the, just to highlight one of the important uh, gaps currently is to align the objectives of decarbonization of the energy system with electrification of transport sector. This is where these, where if, 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 if we make this uh, alignment, there will be actually benefits of having vehicles uh, in there. Uh, and charging them in the right place and so forth. So we are actually going to make best use of these renewable resources properly. Uh, and also the, uh, the, uh, the other aspect is that uh, this, you know, we're Sorry. also moving into this digitalized world where this smart control is now getting into place. And if we link that with this uh, EV charging that's going to be, is going to be massively you know, uh, uh, supporting cost-effective transition to low-carbon system. Just another example, you know, there is a lots of, as you may know, interest in, in, in uh, building lots of batteries to support wind and so forth, but there will be, you know, more than, in the UK, more than 100 gigawatts of batteries in the cars. Why we don't start aligning though and making use of those as well to align with the energy system decarbonization. And if we get this, this, this properly aligned, I think this is going to be really, really important and beneficial. It would also sort out the consumer issues. And in terms of using these batteries in cars, how much of a barrier is the, the ownership model of, of cars that we have at the moment? Ryan talked about, you know, the, we're going to have autonomous vehicles in 10, 15, 20 years, um, which presumably will, you know, be less less owned by by individuals than than cars currently are. I mean, is there is it a barrier if it's your vehicle, um, and you have this vehicle to to grid model? Um, it's that sort of you lose control, don't you, uh, to to a certain extent? Do you think that that is a sort of cultural barrier to to expanding the use of vehicle to grid? Well, I, I think it's uh, at the fundamental level, it's the it's the alignment of the 
uh, which requires just in my, you know, uh, I'm not an expert in, in, in kind of social aspects, but uh, if we had a proper market regulatory framework, then whatever you make a decision, it's up to you to, to make a decision, no problem. Yeah. But there will be such a massive opportunity to, you know, to, to uh, have your charging done and also say get paid for charging while not compromising or service quality which you need. And we just need to somehow try to align it and let them consumers to decide when and what they want to do. But we need alignment with the low carbon agenda is one of the core aspects which, is, which, is, which needs to be sorted out. Sure. One of the hardest bits of that though is the middle of the day. So if you model it and you say everybody charges when it's cheap, well, actually what you end up with is everybody charges in the middle of the day because there's a lot of solar. Not everybody, but there's a portion. It goes to the edges of the night and it goes to the middle of the day. There's a lot of solar. But what you can do is create another peak in demand in the center of the day. It's already quite peaky in the middle of the day anyway in quite a lot of countries. You no, then no, create a bigger peak and then you have to build infrastructure to suit no, no, the, the other peak. So it no, no, is quite that, a difficult just, problem. No, I, I think this does, if, 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 the, if the pricing was cost reflective that will be sorted out but reflecting the cost of the grid upgrade i think there. is difficult no i don't think but anyway yeah i, I think it's all to do with the, you know as to as to whether the market is properly and if you make a decision you want to do you decide and you're going to pay that's fine but there is a massive opportunity to to actually align those th those objectives in terms of the energy infrastructure and what what the, what the users need if this was aligned we could get this, uh, you know, to, to decarbonize this much more cost effectively. Goran, I wanted to ask you a, a quick question related to, like, first of all, did, did you know Professor Andrew Frank? He was one of the original Vita G guys in, in California. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he's, he was one of my professors at UC Davis. I, uh, he was, I mean, he's way ahead of his time. He's fantastic. But the, the question I, I was actually thinking, you know, as, as you talk about, you know, the pricing signals and the, and the change in behavior and, 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 you know, generating revenue or not, and obviously, you know, I, ha I have an analogy that comes to mind in the United States around if you, if you make something, uh, you know, go from private ownership to the commons, I, I know you, you, you know, you didn't say you're a psychologist, I'm, I'm not either, but I'm going to play one for a second. The, the idea that you can, there was a company called Comcast or AT&T, all, all these internet providers, they were trying to shave a chunk of bandwidth off and just make that be like a public asset. And everybody freaked out that, that, that they were losing a, a little bit of their bandwidth. It was an analogy I just thought of as, as I was thinking of, okay, there's this conversation around, what if you just shave a little battery off, off their you know, off their range and, and use that to, to buffer the peaks and low valleys of the grid. How do you think of, about that psychology? Just a, just a little bit, like, is it, if you align everybody and point them in the right direction, can you get the public to say, yeah, yeah, use, use, use my car as a, bu a little, little buffer for the grid, why not? Yeah, but I mean, the, the, the core, the core cap, this, you know, it's, uh, it's to align you know, the, the objectives of the investors and users with the objectives of the country and, you know, decarbonization. This, this is what, where the big gap is. And if we don't have this align, then, you know, we won't have this, but, but, you know, if the users decide we want to do the wrong thing, that's fine. You're going to get, you know, you're going to pay, that's okay. But let's, let's have the, the proper arrangement so that, uh, you know, that, that, we, that we can make the right decisions uh, and then you know that is that is where where the big gap is currently. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, thank you, guys. This is a fascinating discussion. We are uh, sort of running over time slightly, so I'm going to um, round it up now with a, a final um, question that uh, I think goes to the heart of where we are at the moment. We are in this chicken and egg. Uh, scenario when it comes to EV charging infrastructure. Um, uh, bearing in mind all the things we've talked about, is it up to uh, the companies that manage the grid um, and EV charging companies to make the first move and, and get this infrastructure in there? Or does it have to be led by consumer demand for 
for EVs. Uh, and this is uh, a question for, for all of you. And I will start completely randomly, just with who's first on my screen with Julia. So I think it needs both. Um, I think, you know, if we think about public charges, they're expensive to install. You, you need to know that there's going to be people using them to kind of recoup that investment. Um, and I think a lot of this will come down to how do consumers want to live and, and, and what, what kind of um, needs are driving uh, these kind of forces. We know that cost is a major barrier to EV adoption. Um, so one of the things that we'd really love to see is, you know, uh, them becoming more affordable for people. Um, Bulb and a number of other leading companies wrote to the Prime Minister and the Chancellor asking them for, for them to cut uh, VAT on green products like EVs, um, because we see that as a way that would help people make this transition to EVs. So, say it's, it's a bit of both, um, but there are probably things that could be done to help us on our way. Sure. Uh, Ryan? Sorry, I was just on mute. Um, I think it's a, it's a mixture of all. You're going to see loads of uh, different types of companies going in. We've already seen a lot of SPACs and IPOs and acquisitions and everybody playing their cards uh, either because they want to go pure play or they want to support their core business. Um, and this is going to be a competition from all types of charging hardware um, and companies as they go forward, whether that be the home charging and workplace or public slow and public fast. Um, and we'll see what the consumer likes and how that plays out from a business model perspective as well. Okay. Ethan, any last comments? I probably said uh, everything I should have said and more, but yeah, it's, it is. It is both. Uh, you know, when when you when you look at, you know, I, I've 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 worked for the companies, I've seen the business models from the inside, and I've I've driven most electric cars and seen it from the outside in. I mean, I heard words like alignment. I heard, you know, I, I said the word incentives a lot. It, you really, it, I mean, to have the politics and the technology now all pointing in the right direction, folks are going to have different approaches and there's going to be good products and bad products and the bad ones will, will, you know, kind of fall apart and fall away and get acquired or fail. So, you know, it's, it's great to see it's just so much activity in the space. Yeah. Uh, Goran? Sorry, I couldn't, I expressed some problems. I couldn't hear your question. Uh, I was basically um, a question about we're in this sort of chicken and egg scenario with, with charging infrastructure. Um, and it's just asking who, who should be leading uh, the, the drive for that. Is it up to the, the companies to, to put the infrastructure in or does it need to be consumer led and, um, you know, we wait till consumers have bought the cars. Well, we probably need both, but on the other side, as I mentioned, I think we also need a bit of strategic thinking. Yeah. We need to be having the, the chargers in place earlier. And that may kind of, you know, and some of those may not be, may not be, you know, turned out not, not to be in the right place. But uh, currently, this chicken and egg is, is a pretty big, um, you know, that uh, people are not buying vehicles because there are no charging points in the right places. Yeah. So, you know, and there is now to have a strategic thinking so that the, uh, you know, that the kind of the regulators can, uh, you know, provide a bit of guidance in there. And obviously that would cost us money, but on the other side, it would accelerate potentially uptake of vehicles and, you know, move us into the right direction sooner rather than later. Yeah. Okay, thank Just you. To agree with that super quick, there's 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 a reason it's both, right? If if I work for one of the private charging companies, we cannot justify putting a charger in somewhere where the utilization is going to be like below some number. Uh, let's say zero percent would not be good for their margins, right? If if a company's in the business of buying electrons and dispensing them and doing o &M on their equipment to make sure that that hardware is available and accessible when somebody wants to pull electrons from it, they, they, can, they can only make that business work if they have north of 20% utilization. So it's very important that there be public leadership in this, that we take the public tax dollars and we build that infrastructure. Otherwise, that infrastructure doesn't get built in places where there aren't electric cars. Like, 
the, the companies that are privately doing this are looking at where the cars are sold and making sure they put infrastructure where there's a market for them to sell electrons. So it needs the government to do it too, so that you pave the way for the equipment to be where somebody is going. Yeah, I mean, just to say that we have done some analysis and one of, one of the core aspects was what is the cost? What is the cost of the pain of not having charging points? William said, if, even if it's a pretty small, you would still do strategic approach and build the charging points more to, to make sure we move forward in the right direction. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, Venus, in the light of what you were saying before about the, the terrible customer experience that people have at the moment, uh, what's your perspective on this, this chicken and egg uh, scenario? Interestingly, after listening to this panel discussion, I actually had an epiphany. Um, <laughs> I mean, hearing all different perspectives, the conclusion I reached, which I felt at the core of me for a while now, um, the charging infrastructure has to come first. I, I don't think it's a chicken and egg thing anymore because there is a mass adoption on the OEM side. All car manufacturers have had some commitments in place and some aggressive targets. Now it's the charging infrastructure that has to catch up. And yes, utilization rate is gonna matter because um, nobody is gonna put in dollars where no cars are going to charge, but you have to look at it as a portfolio approach. Um, a single site approach may not make the business model, but you have to look at it portfolio. If you analyze it from portfolio perspective, business model will work. So my answer is it's not chicken and egg. It has, at this point, we're at that juncture where it's charging infrastructure is gonna be ahead of car manufacturers for this to become a mass adoption. And do you think there needs to be some kind of public support to, to get charge points into places where, you know, where they won't be widely used, but where not having them will, you know, cause a real problem for, for people. I absolutely believe that it, it has, like I said, it has to be uh, not on your mind when you are going to a grocery store, when you're going from, let's say, LA to San Francisco, you don't want to plan out your route. You just want to have this, even if it's a low yeah. utilization place, I will have a charger available. Yeah. Um, so yes, it has to become ubiquitous with your day-to-day -day routine. Sure. Okay. Uh, well, I think we've uh, exceeded our our targets with one epiphany. Uh, so um, I'll leave it to, to Pilgrim to 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 finish off and, and round up uh, the discussion. Well, I, I know we're already over time. So I, I wrote a I wrote a very long list of all the amazing points you've all made. Uh, I so appreciate everyone's contributions. I don't I'm not have time to read that list out. I'm afraid because we're running over time. But um, so many interesting points, and I'm wonderful that we've had an epiphany. I mean, that really is a lot. <laughs> Particularly appreciative of our West Coast uh, panelists who've got up to start at six a.m. I'm really, really very thankful to you, but to everyone. Uh, it's been a fascinating thing, and I think we could probably have ten more panel sessions about the topics we've raised today. So thank you all very much indeed. Yeah.